Kind of, kind of. You know, this week was really interesting. Obviously, it's spring break, and I'm encouraged. Kind of side note, my ADD is kicking in. I'm encouraged because I look around, and this place is pretty packed. And it's spring break, and there's like, I know at least 10 families that could be here today that are normally here. And so I'm kind of excited that the Lord just keep adding to our, to our body here. So yesterday, as Rick alluded to, um, we went to Walmart on Petrenko in 1604. And I was so encouraged by that as well. We had a ton of you from church show up and help serve and help hold signs and help give free hugs and help, you know, do whatever we needed to do to help this fundraiser. And then we also had a ton of you from this church to go out and sell tickets. And then we had a ton of you that would go out and donate items such as water and chips and drinks and all these things to bring down our costs so we could have a profit uh, to help go towards our missions funds. And so, you know, it was really an encouraging day. Now, why do we do all that? We did all that because we're trying to send a team from Vista Community Church to Guatemala this summer. Now, why are you going to send a team to Guatemala this summer? Well, Guatemala, like many countries, have many individuals that live on less than $1 a day. Now, think about that for one second. Trying to live off less than $1 a day. And they do it. Now, the particular ministry we're going to partner with ministers to families living and working near the city dump. So in other words, when all the dump from the city, Guatemala is a huge city, Guatemala City, they accumulate all this dump. And so people illegally go into the city dump and they're what they call are called scavengers. We call them treasures. They're looking for food. They're looking for items to turn around so they can sell, so they can make some more money, so they can live. Now, it's a vicious cycle there because they don't have good education. They don't have good medical. They don't have um, any finances. They don't have good social status. And so you can imagine kids growing up in that. They don't have such a thing as American dream. They know that this is their life. And they fall into this vicious cycle generation after generation after generation. It's hard to get out of there. That's why the Potter's House really wants to help the least of these so that they can get an education, so they can get some medical care, so they can learn to get out of that situation and it, that cycle won't repeat itself. So I say all that because, you know, there's a lot of people that are in need and we should go and help the least of these. That's what the scripture tells us to do. Scripture speaks a lot about helping the orphan, helping the widow, uh, and so helping the, the alien. But here's the interesting thing. The scripture says a lot about the rich person too. In fact, the scripture says that it is harder to get into the kingdom of heaven if you are wealthy than it is for the poor. So our hearts gravitate towards helping the poor, which is a good thing. We say they need Jesus and we want to be the hands and feet. We want to go and help the least of these. But here's the weird thing about it. The rich need Jesus too. In fact, the scriptures say that the rich are, the, are harder to reach because of their wealth. They think they have everything. So this morning, before we get into the text, I'm actually going to have a helper come up here this morning. So, Caden, where are you at, buddy? Come on up here. I'm going to get you a microphone. <clears throat> I was going to read the passage of scripture, but I decided, you know what? I'm going to take, like, Caden. Caden, what grade are you in? Fourth grade, you can speak into the microphone there. Uh, let's see, fourth grade. Fourth grade. Is it on? <coughs> Stephen, <coughs> Christy, they left the building, huh? <laughs> All right, do you know how to turn on the, his microphone? All right. <laughs> you want to wear this headset? Is this creepy if I'm giving you a headset? No. Okay. Because it's connected to me, so that's the that creepy part. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so practice talking in there. <coughs> we'll do uh, a sound check. Um, Say hello. Hello. Say hi. Hi. Say my name is Caden. My name is Caden. All right, buddy. Now speak loud and clear, and I want you to just to tell everyone what you want to share with us this morning. Go ahead. Well, I'm sharing a passage that I'm doing for speech at my school. 
And it's Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. Okay. There's some older people in the back that can't hear you. Uh, from can, it's Mark chapter 10. Can you hear him okay? Because if, if you can, I'm about to hand him the, the microphone. Try, try to speak, speak loud, speak clear. Okay. And, you know, you can talk to those people there, too. Like, there's people okay. there. All right. There's people there. But Mom's recording him, so he's looking at Mom. Okay, go ahead. It's Mark chapter 10, verses 17 through 27 from the New International Version Bible. Do I say the first? Go ahead. It's all you, brother. The rich and the kingdom of God. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all of these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciples were amazed at his words, and Jesus. but Jesus said again, How hard, wait no, children, how hard is it? To enter the kingdom of God, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed at his words and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked around and said to them, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, give him another round of applause, guys. <laughs> so randomly what I do is I select people to come up and memorize scripture. So I'm going to be picking... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, that takes a lot. For several things. One, public speaking is one of the most difficult things to do. And, and this fourth grader just got, got up here and just spoke. Um, the second thing that was very difficult to do is he memorized, memorized scripture. And I'm not talking one passage or one verse. I'm talking, I think it's like 12 or 13 verses that he memorized. How many, 14? 10. Okay, 10 verses. <laughs> so, you know, for all you have who have excuses, I can't memorize scripture. I'm sure you have good excuses, but... I think he just proved that, you know, with God, all things are possible. Great job, brother. So with that passage, um, let's look at that passage this morning. Let's, let's look and see. Um, let's kind of break down that, that passage this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 10. If not, feel free to look up here. It's also written in your handout. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and he fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Let's look at that for a second. Because it's easy for us to kind of fly through that passage. We don't know much about this guy just yet. He, he's mentioned in other gospel accounts. We're told later that he's very wealthy. We're told that he's a young, rich, religious leader. So he's young and he's rich. Think about the Kardashians for a moment. Young, rich, wealthy. The Trumps, you know, their kids, that next generation of Trumps are coming up. They're young, they're rich, they have power, they have authority. This is this guy. This guy is young, he's rich, and he's a religious ruler. 
Some believe that he actually oversees his own synagogue. And so there's a lot of responsibility with this young religious man. He's very wealthy. He runs up to Jesus. Picture this for a moment. A young, wealthy, religious person running up to Jesus. And the scripture tells us that he falls on his knees before him. And then he asks this question. But before he asks this question, he calls him good teacher. Now, let's flip the next slide because I'll come back to the good teacher part. Jesus asked this question, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Okay, hold it right there. So he's calling Jesus good. And he says, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? He said, no one is good except for God. Now, at a quick glance, when we read that, we might think, wait a second. Jesus is saying, don't call me good because I'm not God. Only God is good. But that's not what he's referring to here. See, when rabbis would never call anyone good, they would only call God good. And so to come up to you and say, good rabbi, good teacher, Jesus is saying, wait a second, you're giving me a title that only God has. Why are you calling me that? Do you know who I am? Do you know that I am the Messiah? Do you know that I am the anointed one? When you come to me and you fall on your knees, which is an act of worship, and he says, good teacher, and he's asking about spiritual, eternal things. This is what must I do to inherit the eternal life? It's interesting because he's got everything this world has to offer, but something is missing. He's got a void deep down in his soul that says, you know, I'm missing something. And that's true for all of us. Song of Solomon, or maybe, no, it's a book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon says that God has put eternity in the hearts of all men. Rich people, if they're really honest, they'll they'll tell you that they have everything the world has to offer, but they're still missing everything something because they're missing god poor people middle class people we get caught up in this cycle we want to be rich we want to be rich we want to be if i can only get this if i can only get that but no matter how many things we accumulate in this world if we're really honest that never satisfies our soul and here's this young rich guy who comes to jesus falls on his knees and he asks him a question what must i do to inherit eternal life which is a good question because he's a religious guy. They're under what's called the law. Okay, Jesus hasn't gone to the cross yet. They're still living under the law. Now, now let's watch the rest of this response unfold here. You know the commandments, Jesus says. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Don't miss that. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come follow me. So this young, rich guy who knows the law, he comes to Jesus, says, what must I do to inherit the eternal life? Jesus says, well, what does the law say? And he starts naming off what we call the Ten Commandments. Now, if the guy is, has a scorecard and he's saying, okay, if I'm going to get to heaven and Jesus has given me this scorecard, he's saying that you shall not murder. He's like, never murdered anyone. Check. You sh- shall not steal. I, I'm wealthy. Never stole anything. Check. You shouldn't defraud. Nope, never done that. Honor your mother and father. I've done that too. I'm looking pretty good here. So far, so good. I mean, I'm doing everything right. But Jesus looks at him and he says, oh, you're still missing one thing. And he gets to the heart of the matter here. See, Jesus doesn't mention the first commandment. The very first commandment that's given is, is you should not have any other gods before me. And this guy has a God. It's his wealth. In fact, the New Testament talks a lot about you can't serve two masters. You can't serve money and serve God. This guy has a lot of money. And it's his God. 
Now, for clarity here, there's nothing wrong with having a lot of money. Okay, I'm not preaching to you today that if you have a lot of money that you need to go sell everything you have. I'm not saying that. Money is what we call amoral. It's not immoral, and it's not moral. It's not good or bad. It's just money. Dave Ramsey, a financial guy, he says that with money, it's like a brick. If I take a bunch of bricks and I get a bunch of people and we go out to cars late at night and we start smashing windows and pulling out stereos, there's nothing wrong with the brick. It was just used in an improper way to steal from people. The same would hold true for if I took a bunch of people and we had a bunch of bricks and we went and built a church building or an orphanage, or a house for someone in Guatemala. There's nothing good or bad about the brick. It's the way that people used it. Same with money. Money is not good or bad. It's the love of money that is the, is at the, it's the root of all evil. If it becomes a God, you can only have one God, Jesus says. You can't serve both. Money is a good thing. Money, we're put on this earth to work and work hard and to to save, to give. With your money, you can actually give to this church. We can further the kingdom by land, by building, whatnot. We can help orphanages. There's nothing wrong with money. But when it becomes our God and it becomes something that's keeping us from God, that's the heart of the issue. Now, he says this. Um, the whole heart here is eternal life. He is thinking, if I can be good enough, and I, I, I know I told, the, told him I wasn't going to do this, but I feel like I need to do this this morning. So bear with me one moment. I'm drawing. <laughs> and, and we have curtains now. So a couple of weeks ago, we didn't have curtains. Um, so, and this rod is going to be in the way, but it's okay. All right, thank you, Jonah. <laughs> Does anybody happen to have a racer? <laughs> hey, if y'all were here last week, this was a sermon right here. We talked about being the hands and feet to Jesus in the community. Okay. So I'm just going to draw this. If you can see this, I hope God somehow uses this because I'm working around lights and curtains and rods and whatnot. We'll get this figured out someday. Okay, so this is important. I would not attempt to draw this if I didn't feel this was important. And some of you who have been at this church long enough know what I'm about to draw. Right? But if I tell you, could, would you come up and draw this for me? Would you, would you want to? No. Okay, it's okay for pastor to draw this every Sunday, but the reason why I draw this is to equip you so that you might know how to share what we call the good news. And this really is good news. Now, um, so I'm going to try to draw as best I can. So y'all know what I'm drawing now, right? All right. Okay, so here is man. I'll move out the way in a second. Here's God. God is holy, according to the scriptures. Man is called sinful. Now, we were not created sinful. We were created in the image of God. Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3. Sin enters our creation and mars our creation, including us. Therefore, Romans 5 says we are in Adam. All of us are sinners. Basically, sin means that you're not perfect. Okay? You, break, you break one of the Ten Commandments. You do something. You lie. You whatever. You're not perfect. But God is perfect. God is holy. And Romans 5, 8 says that why we were still sinners, it says God demonstrates his own love for us. How? That while we were still sinners, someone finish it. Christ died for us. So here is the bridge. That's the cross, in case y'all can't see over there. It's supposed to be a cross. So the way that we inherit eternal life is not by being good. You can't be good enough. 
The way you have eternal life is found in God. One God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we call him the Trinity. He sends Jesus, his only begotten Son, born like us, but not sinner. He's born like us. And he goes to the cross for us, and he lies down his, lays down his life for us. So he takes away our sins. And when you believe in him, when you die, you stand before the father and you and he says, why should I let you into my heaven? Don't give him your resume. Well, I'm good. I'm nice. And I helped out with a fundraiser and I went to Guatemala and I went to church on Sunday. You're still a sinner. So what gets you into heaven? Well, I don't deserve to be in heaven, but Jesus died for me and has forgiven me. And I place my faith in him. And so because of the cross, I can now be bridged back to the Holy God. Holy God. So if, if there's anyone in this room this morning who, who does, if I ask you this question, if you die tonight, where would you spend eternity? If there's a question mark in your head right now, like, I don't know. I think I'm good. I, I don't know. I try, you know, but I did this when I was younger. I don't know. Here's the answer. It's like when you go to, School and they give you a test. I love the open book test. <laughs> this one's an open book test. I'm not trying to trick you here. I'm giving the answer. The answer is Jesus. You place your faith in Jesus, for by grace you're saved through faith in Jesus. You, you, not by your good works, so no one can boast. You are saved by God's grace through Jesus. And then when you stand before God, you, he, see, he doesn't see your sin. He sees Jesus who has taken away your sins. This is important. I wouldn't move curtains and stuff around if I didn't think this was important. This is important. For those of you who, oh, Pastor, I've heard that every Sunday now. Okay, learn to draw this because you are the hands and feet of Jesus. When you go out and talk to your friends over coffee, start spiritual conversations with them. Don't cram it down their throat but listen to them. Hey, if you die tonight, where would you spend eternity? And listen. And they'll tell you what they believe. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm good, but I'm, you know, I don't know where I'd go. Well, can I tell you what I believe? This is what I believe. I believe that I am a sinner saved by God's grace, and he sent Jesus to die on the cross for me to forgive me of my sins. I believe in him. This is the good news. This is the gospel. You got to learn to share this, guys, or I'm going to keep drawing it. Okay. Let's go ahead and keep a look in verse 22. Now, remember, Jesus tells him to sell off everything, to get rid of his God. At this, the man's face fell. And he went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, children, is this his family? Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to the teacher, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Now, let's, let's kind of unpack this for a moment. I'm having a hard time. My little ear pierce thing <laughs> fell off, so that's weird. Okay, so Jesus looked around and said to his disciples that it's hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Then he gives them this word picture. He says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, what is, it, what is an eye of a needle? There's, if you do some research, you're going you're gonna to get some debate here what this means. One school of thought is what I typically think of is when there's a camel. Imagine a big camel. Imagine a sewing needle. It has a little eye. And it's impossible for a big camel to ever go into that little eye. Okay, that's kind of what I picture. But... There is such a thing called the eye of the needle, which was a gate. 
that was, if you think about a city who has a fortified city with walls all around it, they have these big gates that swing open where military can march in and they can shut it so that the, the foreign armies couldn't march in. But they had, in case you got locked out, what was called an eye of a needle, which was a smaller gate with only one person could walk through. So the way we might understand this is this. How many of you have ever stored your items that you have in a storage unit we've all been there right okay that's the american dream right you save as much you get as much as you can and then you got to put it somewhere <laughs> so you got to go put it into a what's called a garage and you got to pay extra money for a garage so that you can put all your things that you just had to have in there and then if it's really valuable things then you got to like get the climate control because you want to protect all the things that you have right so let's just say this. I've been there, okay? I'm, I'm still there. No, I'm not now, but I've been there. Okay, so here, here's, here's how it works. So you have a house, and you're like, man, it sure would be nice to keep up with the Joneses. I need a bigger house. I've been there, okay? And then so you put your house on the market, and then you're like looking around for another house, and then so you find another house that you really like, and it's not going to be ready for X, Y months. So now you're like, okay, well, I got to like sell my house, and so you sell your house, and so you take all your earthly possessions, put it in a truck, and beep, 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 you open up the big U-Haul thing, and then you start hauling all your earthly possessions into this big storage unit, and you shut it. So now, fast forward three to six months, your house is ready. All right. You close pretty late. So now you get the keys to your house, and then you get to the storage unit, and so you get into through the gate, and you spend all day putting all your stuff back into the storage unit, and then you start to drive out. And then you get to the little keypad, and you forget the code. And there's nobody in the office, and you're stuck with this big U-Haul with all your earthly possessions, and you can't get out because the gate is shut. It's locked. Have you been there? <laughs> this is not a true story. This is hypothetical. <laughs> and so you're trying, like, you're, you're trying, there's like four, four, you're trying, you're, oh, what was my password? Seven, four, no, three, four, uh, pound, no, it's not opening. So you park your truck. This is hypothetical. Don't laugh. It's not true. <laughs> you park your truck, and then there is a little gate that you can exit. But you can't bring all your stuff with you. And so you have to go out, and you got to go to your car because your car's parked outside, and then you realize that there's a little card they gave you with your little gate code. And so you come back in, and you type, the, you type this in. Remember your gate code? Here's your gate code. It's a it's, it's, um, weak the, the younger people call them hashtags. We call them pounds, pound sign. <laughs> okay. So here, here's your gate codes. Well, it's seven, seven, seven pound. Okay. That opens a gate. And you get out with all your earthly belongings. And you get to go enjoy your life. That's the same what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying, look, you get to heaven's gate and you got all this stuff that you've been spending your whole life trying to accumulate because you think it's going to make you happier. And so, you know, we're taught from a young, young age that I have the, the iPhone 1 and everyone else has an iPhone 2. I better get the iPhone 2. And now they got the 3. I better get the 3 and the 4 and the 4 and the 6 and the 6. And you keep going and going and going and going and going. And it never stops. And then the same holds true with the TVs. I got to have this TV. I got to have that TV. I got to have this TV. And I got that TV. Most, some of you have more TVs than you have kids. You just got TVs everywhere. But it's going to make you happy. You got to have a TV in all my rooms. And this is a vicious cycle. And, 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 and you, every area of our life, guys, we do this over and over and over. If I get this car, I'm going to oh, be so happy. And then I finally paid this car off. And guess what? I'm going to go get another one, and I'm going to trade it in, and I'm going to start paying off again for four more years. Now, this time, let's do it six years and make it a little last a little longer, and then I get it six years, and then guess what? I pay it off, and I trade it in again. This is the American dream. This is the, I'm, I've been there, guys. I'm, maybe this is just me, but this is, I think, a sample of our DNA, the culture. Jesus is telling them, look, with with man, this is impossible for you to get into heaven. But with God, with God, it is possible. When you enter this earth, you bring nothing into this earth. You are naked. 
That's all you bring into this earth is you're just a naked baby. When you leave this earth, you take nothing with you, nothing. Hopefully they bury you with clothes on, but you are, you don't take anything with you. And this is what Jesus is trying to tell him. He's like, look, enjoy this life. Get a house, you know, have a picket fence, have a car, have three kids, whatever those things are, but don't let those things be your God. Because at the end of the day, we're talking about eternity and you can't take any of those things with you. Now, let's, let's close real quick, real quick. 28. Peter said to them, we left everything to follow you, Jesus. I tell you the truth, Jesus replied, no one who has left home, our brothers, our sisters, our mother, our father, our children, our fields for me, and the gospel, there's the good news, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields with them. But persecution is going to be attached to it. And in the age to come, they will receive eternal life. This is the words of Jesus. Jesus is saying, guys, you might give up some things, but he's always going to provide for you. In fact, in some countries, when they follow Jesus, when they really believe this, you go to Muslim countries, you no longer have a mother and father. You're banished. In fact, you might even be killed for the gospel. But here's what Jesus is saying. He's worth it. Not only for the life to come, because Correct me if I'm wrong. Jesus tells him, in my father's house, there are many mansions. He's a creator of all things. All things are created by him and for him. You might lose your life, but you gain life because everything that Jesus has is ours as part of the family of God. In fact, you might give up brothers and sisters biologically, but you gain a whole bunch of brothers and sisters spiritually. That's the church. That's who we are. And that's what Jesus is telling me. He's, he's telling us the same thing. He said, there's nothing that you can get that, that you have that is more valuable than me. Nothing. So you might think you're giving up something. You're not giving up anything because you still have Jesus. That's what's most important. Now, I'm going to give you one more verse. Do we have Luke chapter 9? Verse 1 through 10, because the sermon series that we're teaching on this next three weeks going into Easter is called Come As You Are. We notice that this guy came to Jesus, but he didn't leave change. In fact, he left with a sad face because he was wealthy and he didn't want to give up things. But I'm going to transition. I'm going to show you another guy in the scriptures who's very wealthy and comes to Jesus. We're going to have a totally different outcome on this guy. And we're going to wait on it. Okay. Totally different guy, totally different text. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of, what's his name? Zacchaeus, by the way, this is my favorite person in the Bible because we have a lot in common. He's a wee little man. He's a little dude. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted, to see, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. Now, remember the first guy we looked at ran to Jesus, fell before his knees, and had a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Here's a guy who's really rich, really wealthy, and he wants to get close to Jesus. He can't get close to Jesus because he's so little. So what he, what he does is he goes to a sycamore tree. Let's see. He ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him. Since Jesus was coming that way, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. Now, this guy must have been a sinner big time because tax collectors were known as unclean people. They took in money, but they robbed people. They broke the law. They robbed people because... You had to pay your taxes and they would take a little bit more because they worked for the Roman government. 
And so people didn't want to be around these people. So listen to the response of the people. All the people saw this and they began to mutter, Jesus has gone to be with a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said, Lord, look, Lord, here and now, here right now, draw a line of the sand here right now. I'll give all my I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. Now, hold on. Jesus told the other guy to give up all his possessions and sell the poor. This guy's not as spiritual because he's only going to give away half. Wait a second. And if I have cheated anyone about anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Do you think the guy cheated some people? And now he's going to go back and pay it back with four times interest. Did you ever watch the movie Flywheel? Look, at, look for this movie, Flywheel. It's, it's, if you've seen um, Facing the Giants or you saw Courageous or you saw Fireproof, it's the same makers. It's like the very first movie. It's about a used car salesman. And the used car salesman was robbing people, getting them to pay more than what the car was worth. And then later he becomes a Christian, Christ follower, and he wants to do it right. And so he has to go back through all his files, and he's calling these people, hey, I sold your car last year. I owe you $4,000 back. I'm like, what? And then he hang up, call the next person. You know, I sold, you, sold your car. I wasn't completely honest with you. I owe you another $2,000 because I took more than what the car was worth. He goes back and does that to every single person. So much that he's actually losing money, and he's about to go out of business. But a local news person is doing a story about all the corrupt car salesmen in the area and they say well we found a breath of fresh air this guy is doing it right and he claims that he's doing it because god told him to do it so the next day the guy goes back to his lot and he's about to close up because he's losing all this money and all these people start showing up we want to buy a car from you we want to buy a car from you we want to buy because you're honest and god blesses them and so now he saves his his money, he does it God's way because it no longer has his heart and he's able to bless. So, so Zacchaeus says, I'm going to give back four times the amount. Two more verses. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. Verse 10. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. That's the key, guys. The reason why Jesus came was to seek and save lost souls. The good news, the gospel. Now, I'm going to challenge you guys with two things. One is ask yourself, is there anything in my life that's keeping me from God? Do you have an idol? Do you have a God that you say, oh, yeah, I, I believe in God. And, but really, this has your time, your energy, and your talent. If there's something in there, the Lord says, put that aside. I want to be first. That's between you and the Lord. You have to just say, Lord, is there something in my life that I'm putting before you? And maybe for some of you this morning, God wants you just to come to him just as you are. You might say, well, I'm a sinner. I've done this. I've done that. Man, I, 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 I've committed adultery. I've stolen. I'm a bad person. I'm a, whatever. You fill in the blank. But according to that scripture, Jesus came for you and for me to seek and to save those that are lost. He came while we were still sinning. He loved us and died for us. Maybe some of you this morning, he wants you to put your faith in Jesus. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. All my sins. I did that in my 20s. If you knew me in my 20s, you, you would say I'm totally different than I am today. Still not perfect today, but I was a totally different guy in my 20s. And when I came to Jesus, I man, I was, I was trying everything the world had to offer. And I said, Jesus, if you're real, I want you to forgive me of all my sins. Make me into the person you want me to be. And the Bible says when you do that, you are born again from the Spirit of God. That happened to me in my 20s. I'm still not perfect but I still follow one who is perfect, Jesus, and I'm striving to be more like him. The second thing I challenge you to do is pray for somebody because really Jesus wants to seek and save sinners. I want you to start praying for people by name. 
could be a family member, could be a, a coworker, could be a neighbor. Think about somebody and say, you know what, Lord, you put this person on my heart. I'm going to pray for them by name. You don't have to tell other people, I'm praying for such and such because they're, they're sinners and they might, I don't know where they're going. You don't have to say that, but I want you to pray faithfully for those people. And over the next three weeks coming up to Easter, I want you to take a step of faith and say, hey, our pastor is doing a sermon series, series called Come As You Are, and he's, he's, he's asking us to invite a friend, and I'd like to invite you to come to church. And I, I'm going to make it real easy for you. Do, do we have that slide? We had to go out and hire a, a shoe model for this picture. The, we had to hire a shoe model. Same jeans, same shoes. All right. So the front of it says, come as you are. And the back of it, it says, leave more like Jesus. And it just has our website and it has our logo. That's it. So as you pray for somebody over the next three or four weeks, because people are going to start thinking about Easter. Maybe they'll go to church on Easter and just say, hey, my pastor is doing a sermon series called Come As You Are. And I would like to invite you. And here's our website, more information. You know, maybe we can go have lunch afterwards or whatever. But pray. We talked about last week, it's a spiritual battle. Pray for people. Pray. Pray that, they, that, that God would, would, would start working their lives. It's not going to be you. It's, the, it's God. But God will use you to help them to know more about him.